Hello, everyone, and welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is Joe Leto, and I'm the production manager of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum and networking platform encompassing finance, technology, and geopolitics. SALT Talks is a series of digital interviews with the world's foremost investors, creators, and thinkers. And just as we do at our global SALT conferences, we aim to both empower big, important ideas and provide our audience a window into the minds of subject matter experts. And we are very excited today to welcome Todd Sears to SALT Talks. Todd is the founder and chief executive officer of Out Leadership, the global LGBT plus business network trusted by CEOs and multinational companies to drive return on equality. Out Leadership creates executive events and insights that help businesses realize the economic growth and talent dividend derived from inclusion. I'll cut the, the bio a little bit short there because we're gonna get in more and more about Todd in a bit from, from the horse's mouth, if you, if you will. But if you have any questions for Todd during today's talk, please enter them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your video screen and we'll endeavor to get to them before the end of the talk. But Todd, it's a, it's a real pleasure. Welcome, welcome to SALT Talks. Thanks, Joe, it's great to be here. I appreciate the invitation. Absolutely, so we begin each SALT Talk asking our guests to tell us something about them that we can't find on their proverbial Wikipedia page. Um, but I'd like to turn it over to you to walk us through, you know, a, a sort of a robust Wikipedia page, if you will, your journey and how you got to where you are today and share your story with the SALT audience. Sure, well, if, uh, if you do go to my Wikipedia page, it's very clear that I am openly gay. So that's, you, you can find that from Wikipedia, but I'll, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll leave that into the, the story. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I knew I was gay when I was four, uh, which for most folks who are LGBTQ, that's actually in the range. Most people know their sexual orientation or gender identity between the ages of three and eight. Um, for me anyway, I grew up in North Carolina and, um, and it took me until I was 18 to actually be comfortable to come out. I uh, moved all around, my dad was in textiles. So I went to nine different schools before I went to boarding school in Virginia. And uh, my, spring of, my spring of my senior year in boarding school at uh, Woodbury Forest in Virginia, I, I came to New York. And I saw a play called Angels in America, uh, which I think a lot of folks have seen, hopefully. It's uh, just celebrated its 25th anniversary last year, which, or two years ago, which you know, nothing like having a play that made you come out, celebrate a 25th anniversary to make you feel old. Um, but I basically, I saw my life kind of played out on that screen. I was the good old Southern boy who was gonna get married, have 2.2 kids, live in a white picket fence, you know, do all the right things. Um, and you see it played out on the screen or on the stage, uh, uh, actually, a character named Joe the Mormon, who was played by a guy named David Marshall Graham, who, uh, if you saw Devil Wears Prada, he was her dad in the movie. Um, and so I, he basically, the, the show showed me what I was going to be if I didn't come out. And so in the Walter Carr Theater in spring of 1994, I came out to myself. And I went back to, uh, to Virginia, and I actually wrote a letter uh, to, uh, to Joe the Mormon, uh, David Marshall Grant, and I sent it to the, the theater. And interestingly, all through my years at Duke, he actually wrote me, we corresponded, and he was kind of my first ally, my first mentor. Um, and he really kind of helped me navigate what it meant to be gay. Because uh, if you think about role models and visible gay people in the 90s, there were very few. Uh, and those that we did have were either very stereotypical drag queens, florists, or people dying of HIV. That was pretty much what you saw. You didn't see gay bankers, you didn't see gay lawyers, you didn't have CEOs who were gay, you didn't have anyone saying that you would have a career if you were gay, right? I mean, it was kind of career suicide at that point in business to, to be gay. Um, and so I you know, sort of internalized that, but also was lucky enough to do to have some great attorney brothers and great supporters. And I was in campus politics. And so out of, out of college, I moved to New York and I went to Wall Street, uh, which was you know, at that point, late 90s. And um, my first boss was a homophobe, I uh, used the, the term faggot on the floor with regularity. And, uh, and it was kind of shocking, actually. I thought back and I thought, you know, I grew up in North Carolina and I never really had issues. Um, and here I am in New York City on Wall Street and I have a homophobic boss, you know, what are the odds? So I, uh, so I did what most gay people do who are in homophobic environments. I went back in the closet and I started looking for a new job. And, uh, and the second investment bank that I worked for, I was super out in my interview. I was like, I'm gay and you need to know this. And, uh, and they were all like, dude, it's totally fine. Like, we're, we're cool with the, the gay thing. Um, but, you know, coming from a homophobic environment, that, that, that mattered. Um, and that was a decision I made that I would never again be in the closet for any point in my career. And what that also allowed me to do was connect who I was as a person to the community that, to which I belong to business. And from an investment banking perspective, it allowed me to actually help win business. 
uh, by connecting with gay CEOs and gay business owners. And so I was in uh, on sell side M&A in media. And we actually won the business of Out and Advocate Magazine merging the second time I think they did it, uh, which ultimately led when I was a private banker to helping take Planet Out Public, which was the first gay IPO, which is pretty exciting. And so the idea that I was able to leverage who I was to have those connections was, was kind of a new thing. And uh, so I switched sides of the world and went to private banking, Merrill Lynch in 2001. And for those who know uh, private banking, probably a lot of folks listening today, uh, you get a phone, a desk, a computer, and they say, bring in a million dollars a month of new assets. And if after eight months, you don't have $8 million, sign or you're fired. Which at that point, I believe the fail rate was 92%. Um, and I put together a business plan for focusing on LGBT financial planning. And believe it or not, in 2001, not a single Wall Street bank had thought about the LGBT community as a market, as a business opportunity. Uh, at that time, because marriage equality was not a reality, there were over 1,049 rights at a federal level that gay and lesbian couples did not enjoy because of federal recognition not being an option. And about 90% of those rights were financial, titling, taxation, estate planning, all of those types of things. And I thought, you know, why isn't another firm talking to these folks? These folks need help protecting their families, protecting their livelihood, protecting their estates. And so I put together a plan and I partnered with Lambda Legal, which is the largest LGBT civil rights organization in the US. And I did domestic partner planning seminars all over the country, helping gay and lesbian couples understand how to protect their assets, how to have a charitable planning component to their, their financial plan, and ultimately how they could support Lambda, HRC. We actually had 31 nonprofits whose endowments I managed at that time. And in the, the first 12 months, I brought in $100 million of net new assets. And after the first four years, I brought in almost $2 billion, um, which was great. It was nice. I got to keep my job. So that was, that was a bonus. Um, but what was also exciting was I, I tracked it as an ROI initiative. I didn't go to Merrill Lynch and say, this is the right thing to do. I said, this is the right thing to do for business. This is the right thing to do for our reputation. This is the right thing for, to do for our employees. Uh, and I tracked it as something that they needed to reinvest in. So I said, you know, I actually got a, a meeting with the head of wealth management, Dan Sontag, uh, my second year, and I got 30 minutes with him and I was 25, I think. And uh, so it was like two years ago. Um, and so I, I said, look, <laughs> right, exactly. I didn't have quite as much gray hair. Um, so I said, look, I've run $100 million in the first 12 months and we as Merrill Lynch can own this market. And if you really want to, we could do it. And here's how we do it. And I asked him for a quarter million bucks of sponsorship and he gave it to me. And I later found out in 37 years at Merrill, he'd never given a financial advisor a dollar, but he gave me a quarter of a million. And the deal was I had to report back to him once a quarter on the ROI and his investment. And the ROI and his investment was twofold. One was new assets under management, but it was also more financial advisors who were focusing on the LGBT market. And I later found out that was a bit of a test because as he said to me later, when he tapped me to kind of lead diversity strategy for him, he said, you're not a financial advisor, you're a leader because a financial advisor would not share his or her ideas and want to bring in other leaders with them, right? That's, that's a leadership role, not an advisor role. And ultimately I'd brought in 250 other financial advisors and helped them sort of do the same thing. So that was the, that was the framework. And along the way, because of the work that we did, Merrill won all kinds of accolades. We actually helped advocate for LGBT equality through marriage equality, through adding um, non-discrimination for sexual orientation and gender identity, transgender medical benefits. We won the HRC award, all because they were doing the right thing for business, not just because they were doing the right thing for LGBT employees and clients. Uh, and along the way, I got to really have some great sponsors and mentors, and we can chat about that as well. But the, the ability as an out gay person to then help other people be out and visible was something I was very proud of. Um, ultimately, as I mentioned, I, he tapped me to run diversity strategy for him, which I did. Uh, and then I was recruited away to Credit Suisse and I was head of diversity and inclusion for them uh, across all their businesses. And in 2010, they laid me off, uh, which was awesome. <laughs> Um, and so I was sitting on my sofa with a severance check and multiple martinis and I uh, thought, all right, what the heck is next? What am I going to do next in my life? And I kind of looked around at my Merrill experience, which was so incredibly positive and wonderful. And, you know, I, I, I was the guy that would get choked up at the Merrill commercials, you know, I'm like, you know, Mr. Loyalty kind of thing uh, with Dollar the Bull. And anyway, and I thought, and I looked around 10 years ago. And if you think back, you know, for the leaders on this call, we didn't see CEOs using their economic platform to advocate for change or equality or any sort of social justice platform. Uh, we didn't have companies using their economic power in places like North Carolina or Indonesia or Singapore uh, to advocate for gay equality or, or really almost anything. Um, and I thought, could I create that conversation? And could I 
use the learning of getting an old conservative Irish Catholic command and control company like Merrill to support gay equality because I tied it to the bottom line. And uh, so I started a summit I called Out on the Street. I used my severance check to fund it. And the idea was using Wall Street as an example and kind of Davos salt talks. I mean, this type of conversation was the model. Um, CEO hosted, senior business leader attended, not a diversity summit, not an HR summit. I really wanted business leaders Um, because HR and diversity folks get it, but if business leaders get it, then they can actually drive change. Um, So our first summit was in March, 2011. So we're almost 10 years old now. I think you guys celebrated 10 years last year, I think, if I'm not mistaken. We did, you you were at our 10th anniversary conference. Yeah, which was awesome. Uh, And so the first six banks were Bank of America, Barclays, City, Deutsche, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley. And I gave each of the the, the the six original banks uh, 10 slots for director level or higher business leaders. And I said, you know, the, the framework's gonna be business, talent, and equality, but in that order, I want you to be in the room because it matters to your business. You've got to have the right talent to execute on it. And equality is the output, not the starting point. And we were 200% oversubscribed for the first summit. Two weeks later, four of those six CEOs signed on for marriage equality for New York. And we grew from there. So I launched in Europe almost nine years ago, in Asia eight years ago. We were the first gay summit ever in Asia, in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and in Sydney, Australia. So now around the world in 2019, we had Davos like summits in New York, London, Hong Kong, Paris, Sydney. Uh, we have talent initiatives for young gay leaders that we've built called Out Next. We have a talent initiative for senior LGBT women called Out Women. We have a board program called Quorum, which we can chat about, um, as well as research on allyship, on self identification, on the business bottom line benefits of LGBT equality. And everything that we've done globally with 650 CEOs and now 85 companies uh, is focused on the idea that business can drive equality, but from a business imperative. Uh, so we get these companies to leverage the economic power they have by doing business in states and countries all around the world to say that discrimination against gay people, LGBTQ people is simply bad for business. And so that's, that's what I'm now doing around the world. I think it's fantastic. Just to go back to, to Angels in America, I actually saw that when it, when it was on broad. I think it was, was it two years ago already? That's yeah. The 25th. I yeah. I took a picture with the wings and everything. That was a, that was something I'll never forget. Um, I just, I don't know, I love the story. And they uh, did a, a mini series of it as well, Meryl Streep and De Niro and like an amazing cast of folks. So if you, if you haven't seen it on this on Broadway, it's still on HBO. So. And that's what I'll be watching this weekend. So yeah. just to, just to go back to SALT uh, 2019 and, you know, yeah. you moderated a panel on uh, diversity leaders from BlackRock, Bank of America, 100 Women in Finance and HP. Yeah. And Leslie Slayton Brown is the chief diversity officer of HP said that they implemented a process at HP to actively track business one because diversity was at the table. So I sort of want to do a, a state of the state, if you will, of how member firms at Out Leadership are able to use the power of business to successfully drive change. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd say a couple of things. I think what gets measured gets done. Um, so I think you know companies like HP that are measuring diversity and their impacts matter. Um, it depends on what they're measuring and how these companies are looking to affect change, right? So internally, I always say that representation is a lagging indicator, to put it in financial terms. Um, it's the result of your corporate culture the last five years. Engagement is a leading indicator. So too often companies say, oh, we don't have enough of insert blank, whatever blank is, women, people of color, LGBT, and we have too many of insert blank here, generally straight white men. And the challenge with that is that you're saying that you're, you're valuing difference differently Right. And the idea is that it's a problem to be solved. It's only focused on headcount and belly buttons. It's not focused on opportunity or business. There's a guy named Martin Davidson in Darden School that talks about leveraging difference. And he actually says it's an opportunity to be capitalized on all elements of difference, both in inherent and acquired diversity count. Right. So acquired diversity is more your, your mentality and your diversity of thought and perspective. And ultimately, everyone, including straight white men, have something to be gained from that idea. Um, and so when companies are looking at this, I really encourage them to think about it as an opportunity, not a problem, that everyone does have a role to play. Uh, and that's on the internal side. On the external side, quite frankly, as we know from pretty much every metric, discrimination is bad for business, whether it's discrimination against black people, white people, uh, LGBTQ people, et cetera. And companies are in a war for talent. So the challenge that, you know, if you're doing business in Singapore, for example, where gay people are still illegal, there's 67 countries around the world where it's still illegal to be LGBT. But in 100% of those countries, we're doing business. So if you wanna actually bring your top talent into Singapore, it's hard. Um, And so if we can get 19% of Singapore's GDP, which is financial services, to say to the Singapore government, 377A, which is the anti-sodomy law that's still in the books, is bad for business, 
then that's how you start to affect change. And that's, that's really the model of our leadership is using that soft power that businesses have to advocate for change because it does matter to their talent, to their clients and to their bottom line. Yeah. And I think this goes well into talking about the, the quorum initiative about leadership. So that works to ensure that LGBTQ plus diversity is central in conversations about board representation and policy. So, you know, are there examples that you can share where, you know, something like, like that having a more diverse board, having more representation at the top actually has affected um, change, whether that's locally or domestic or internationally? Yeah. Well, so I'd say, so first of all, quorum is our board program and we've been doing it for about seven years now. And the idea, quite frankly, was expanding the board conversation to include LGBT folks at board diversity you know, level. Uh, so too often the conversations around board diversity only center on race and gender and historically have not included LGBTQ. And to me, that's just a missed opportunity because there are LGBTQ people of color, women, et cetera. So why wouldn't you broaden the pool? Um, and the first step of that is actually including people in the policy. And so we're actually literally today relaunching out leadership's policy in a box uh, there are only 12 companies in the Fortune 500 that include LGBT and the definition of board diversity currently. Uh, there were only two, so we've gotten 10 to amend their policy, which is great. Uh, we've also gotten CalPERS, CalSTRS, uh, New York City and New York State pension funds to include LGBT in the definition of diversity that they mandate for their investment strategies. Uh, so they have to have board diversity in the, the governance of the companies that they make investments in. And then a lot of private equity firms, you know, KKR, Carlisle, et cetera, are in the same, and Blackstone and BlackRock are in the same kind of a, a, a zeitgeist in terms of using their buying power of you know, the market to actually say that this is something that matters to them. Uh, so it's about having people involved in the conversation. It's about including people in the policy, uh, but then it's about holding companies accountable. Uh, the California law that just passed last month is a great example, I think. Uh, so it requires all companies doing business or based in California uh, to have diversity at the board level. Um, we've been advocating the last three years and, and thanks to a lot of lawmakers in California who listen, LGBT is included in that definition um, for those, those companies. Goldman Sachs, David Solomon actually announced at Davos this last year that Goldman would no longer take a company public if they did not have a diverse board. And for Goldman Sachs, that Goldman was actually one of the two companies originally that included LGBT in the definition of board diversity. So for Goldman, LGBT is included, uh, and they're actually a supporter of the Quorum Initiative, as is KPMG, Ropes and Gray, um, and uh, Egon Zender is coming on board as well. So it's, it's kind of a mixture, I guess, is the best way to say it, that, that it does matter for folks to be included at the top. It's not about belly button counting and saying you have to have one gay person, one black person, one woman, but it is about broadening the pool and saying you really should have diverse thoughts and perspectives. And most of the research out there does show that diverse thought and perspective leads to better outcomes. Yeah, and I was gonna I was gonna follow up with this, and you kind of answered it, but I guess we can extrapolate on it a little bit. And you know, some companies approach diversity and inclusion as as belly buttons, as optics, as look, we have a gay person, you know, throw us a bone. So how do we push back on the tokenism when data and business case here you're gonna you will make money? You this is good for business. How do we how do we push back on those those companies that say no, it's just not for me? Well, you know, I, I, there's a great Peter Drucker quote that I like. Um, you know, he's Mr. If you, any of the MBA schools really do a lot of, of Peter Drucker focus. Um, and he has this great quote, which he says, in business, you don't have to change. Survival is optional. And I, I really look at it in that way with, with all these conversations. Nobody required, you know, you shouldn't be required uh, to have to do these things. But if you're forward thinking business in today's world, purpose matters. And the consumer actually does care what you as a company do with your employees in your supply chain, in your climate address, you know, how you address climate, how you address LGBTQ people, Black Lives Matter. Like, and the, the tie in to me as well is if you look at the data that shows that people don't actually trust the government, people do trust CEOs in business now. And right? over the last 10 years, that has dramatically changed. 10 years ago, it was risky for a CEO to speak out on gay issues, for example. Now it's actually risky for companies not to have some sort of perspective. Um, so, you know, I, I think, you know, the, the tokenism is, is one key piece of it. And I think it really depends on how the companies approach it. Uh, it goes back to opportunity versus problem, right? I, you know, uh, one, a great example I love from, from research on the trading floor, uh, testosterone levels on the trading floor go down if you have a better gender balance, which leads to less risk taking, which leads to better returns, right? That's not saying that you need to hire more women because you need to hire more women. It's saying a better gender balance gets you better outcomes. Um, Malcolm Gladwell's Blink book, I think, is a great example as well. He talks about symphony orchestras and the percentage of women that were in symphony orchestras in like 1980 was something like 4%. Uh, 
And there was an audition that one of the people auditioning had a connection to the conductor. And so they decided to do the auditions blind. And so all of the, the folks auditioning for this role went behind the screen, played their piece, and the conductor uh, two thirds away through said, ah, that's it, that's the person, that's, th that's who I want. And out walks a woman. And she's a, I think it was a brass instrument. And he said, well, women can't play a brass instrument. You don't have the lung capacity, you're too small. Let's do this again. Does it again, points, says, that's the person I want. Out walks the same poor woman. And he ultimately hired her as second chair. She still had to earn to go to first chair, which is complete BS. But ultimately, symphony orchestra auditions now are all done blind. What percentage of symphony orchestras are now women? Roughly 40%. They didn't do it because they needed more women, right? As a tokenism, right? It was they needed the right people with the right skills to make the right sounds to, to make the, the great orchestra. So I think the idea of removing blind spots and actually having people there for their skills and their uh, I would say what they bring to the table versus their gender, ethnicity, orientation is how companies should look at it. Uh, unfortunately, too often companies don't. Um, and you, there's this balance of holding companies accountable for that. Yeah, you actually just reminded me of my, I mean, in my past life, I was, I was not for singer, so I went to school, undergrad and grad for music. So right. awesome. having my friends go behind the wall and I, you know, it was, it was amazing. I was like, oh, you can't really do this for music, for, for singing, actually. Like that's, I don't know if it would work. They can't tell if you can emote or anything, but it's, you know, imagine that was done, out, you know, more broadly. Yeah. Um, and companies are looking at that. There's some companies that on resumes, they'll take off people's names because that can be, you know, an identifying factor or take people's universities off so that they don't, you know, do the, oh, I went to Duke too, kind of, you know, frat guy sort of thing or what, you know. So removing opportunities for people's blind spots to sort of overtake the reason um, is, is smart. Yeah. I want to want to turn to something that's been on on no one's mind the past week, and I guess that's politics and <laughs> and and the election. Um, nothing nothing too salacious or scandalous, I promise. But um, I just want to get your your opinion on on what a Biden Harris administration would look like for LGBTQ rights. Obviously, we had you know a surprise, honestly, but major victory this summer um, with with Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, but. Today, um, I believe oral arguments are beginning for Fulton v. Philadelphia um, for Catholic services. So, you know, everyone, you know, Democrats, pro-gay. But what, what does that translate to you? And how, how are you going to be advocating with the new, with the change administration? Well, I would say a few things. I think, one, it's a mistake to assume that LGBT inclusion is just a Democratic issue. Um, I think there are significant numbers of Republicans, independents, um, who, who look at discrimination as bad for business or bad for the country or bad for themselves, their families. Um, Ken Melman, who's now leadership board member for many, many years, organized the Republicans' amicus brief for marriage equality. Um, Paul Singer has spoken at our summit, Dan Loeb. There are a lot, of, a lot of folks who you would not necessarily put in the camp, per se, of liberal support, and yet they do support inclusion, which I, I think is just worth pointing out. Um, sure. Because I think as we go forward as a country, 71 million people voted for Trump and they can't all be bad folks who are anti-LGBT. In fact, I don't think anti-gay animus was a driver for them. I think uh, a lot of people looked at the economics and, and that was more of a driver. Unfortunately, for minorities and LGBT folks, politics is personal. And I think that's what kind of got lost a lot in this election, right? That folks who are, are not LGBT or from majority community or aren't black or Hispanic or immigrant or Muslim, um, don't necessarily understand the fear that so many minorities lived under for so long of losing our rights. If you look at the you know, LGBTQ in particular, trans folks have lost significant rights in the last four years. Uh, gay people have been discriminated against. You know, Bostock was a great example from a Supreme Court perspective, but in 37 states, you can still be criminalized for having HIV. You can still just, you know, the sexual orientation, uh, non-discrimination included in employment, but not in housing. So gay and lesbian people can still lose their housing across the United States. Um, the gay adoption has been removed from so many states. That there's so many elements of our just basic humanity and human rights that have been taken away slash threatened. And I think that's what is hard for folks who are not part of these communities to necessarily understand. Uh, so when you're voting for someone who says those rights shouldn't exist, you're literally voting against my own humanity and my, my right to exist. And that, that's hard for some folks to take. Um, so it, that, that idea, I think, is something that ha has gotten lost that I, I think will, under a Biden-Harris administration, be, I think, you know, obviously more positive from an LGBTQ perspective, from a minority perspective. Um, everyone that I've spoken to in the last week just feels like we finally can exhale 
Um, and I think that's a very common sentiment. But at the same point, I think we've got to do a great or a better job of building bridges among folks who did not understand why it mattered uh, and educating folks. And I, I think that is on us to, to create those conversations. As it relates to LGBTQ in particular, I think we will see a lot of support from this administration, just like we did from the Obama administration. Um, I, I do think you know, the, the case that you mentioned, I, I, if I were to make a prediction, I do think we will have challenges with religious freedom going forward. Uh, and that will be at the Supreme Court level. I think there's a, a misconception that there is a religious right to discriminate, uh, that, that people's closely held religious beliefs give them the right to infringe on my civil rights, uh, which is not the case. Um, we should never have the, 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 the right to discriminate against anyone based off of closely held religious beliefs. Everyone has the same right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Um, and you know, my marriage or relationship or whatever does not infringe on anyone else's civil rights. And when people have actually gone to court and been, they've been asked to explain how marriage equality somehow impacted their marriage, they were not able to do it. Um, so you know, the, there are, I think, a lot of challenges that we have still ahead of us, but I'm excited about the direction our country is heading um, and the opportunity to continue to create these conversations. Absolutely. Pivoting off of that, we escaped without any major <laughs> Any major declarations. Twitter's blowing up right now. I don't know. I, <laughs> Absolutely. Our, our, our lives are going followers crazy. are just going nuts. <laughs> so, um, I, you know, I, representation is, is tremendous. I know we touched on it in the beginning. I just, I just want to go back because we have an anecdote from, from yesterday. Uh, we, were, we had a SALT talk um, featuring two Black venture capitalists. And at the end, our moderator re remarked that she couldn't identify many other instances, if any, of two black VCs having conversations on a platform, you know, not to toot our own horn, but such as SALT, such as WEF, well, such as Out Leadership, that, you know, it just isn't happening as much as possible. And then sometimes when you're on the other side of this, I don't know if you've had this um, experience, and I'm curious to know your, your thoughts, you program these amazing, robust conversations, and then you almost have to get people to kind of care. And it's, it's a, it's a, chicken and egg of, of how you get people in the room to witness what's going on and what amazing ideas are happening. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm just curious your thoughts on, on how we continue to promote people. Is, is it just that we have to continue putting them out there, making their voice heard and promoting them as much as we can with the platform that we have? I, I think what you, the, the last piece of what you said, I think is the right answer. So, you know, one of the learnings, I think, from the Black Lives Matter movement, it was the idea that significant numbers of Black Americans did not have access to a platform. Uh, to tell their stories and and to be seen and heard, um, as well as to to fight systemic racism that still does exist in our country. Um, so one of the things from an leadership perspective we've been trying to do is is find opportunities to to use our platform to to share diverse voices. We're actually doing a a big announcement tomorrow about a, a new Black Trans initiative that we're kicking off in that same way, um, bringing a, an amazing leader onto my team, which I'm excited about. Awesome. Um, but. But you know the idea that take allies for example, and I think this kind of ties into a, a, one way to look at your question: um, the idea of being an ally to the black community, to the gay community, to any of these marginalized communities, is that you are lending your your voice, your power, your your platform, uh, so that those who don't have access to that platform can create some sort of visibility for themselves um, and create opportunities for conversation. So you know, as as you're convening conversations and using Salt's platform. To bring together black VCs, I think that's fantastic. Um, that's, you know, as we were chatting before, it, it's it's one thing to do it in a, an ecosystem of folks that would ordinarily expect to see uh, such a conversation. It's really, I think, probably a whole lot more impactful uh, to do it in an ecosystem where that's not the expected uh, conversation, um, because ultimately we have to reach more than just the choir. Um, and I think that's that's the opportunity that you guys are creating. And I think you know, as we go forward from an leadership perspective, that's what we're also trying to do as well. Yeah, and I'd like to point out, this might be a milestone. I'm gonna to have to go back and double check, but I think this is the first salt talk with two out members of the LGBTQ community. So I can high five you through there. <laughs> awesome. But um, turning to, turning again, I, I have a really good way of getting the more somber things. Um, COVID, turning to COVID, obviously we're virtual, we're not together. Um, how is how are you guys responding to the COVID pandemic? What have you heard from from your member firms, maybe maybe from yourself, or your own experiences about the the experience of people in the LGBTQ community? How are we disproportionately affected, if at all? Yeah. Um, so 
we actually c convened as part of, I think when we went virtual in March, we convened actually the first conversation on HIV, uh, LGBT and COVID uh, and sort of the intersections thereof because there was a huge fear that HIV positive and uh, folks with AIDS would be disproportionately impacted from a COVID perspective. And interestingly, so we had the head of WOW Cornell Medicine uh, and the president of Mount Sinai, who's actually openly gay as well, discussing those issues. Uh, and fascinatingly, folks with HIV and AIDS, not to be only you know, thinking that only LGBT people are HIV positive, by the way, um, were actually not at a greater risk, which was interesting, primarily because the medications that, that people are taking, including the Gilead and Remdesivir, that ultimately was being used to treat COVID now. Um, so maybe it was a, a silver lining, if you will. Um, from an LGBT community perspective, you know, I think the, the data is actually that we were not disproportionately, disproportionately affected, but black and brown communities are and were. Um, and that's across the United States. There is intersection there, but uh, you know, economics really do sort of drive a lot of that and you know, access to medical care, access to, to space, uh, right? There, there, there are a lot of economic indicators that predispose people to be much more impacted by COVID. And unfortunately, the, the black and brown communities of our country were much more impacted than the LGBT community, um, which you know, leads to all kinds of other not necessarily positive outcomes as well. So it, and it underscores the need for better inclusion and, and more of us to understand what the situation is in black and brown communities across the country. Absolutely. Turning to out leadership, I know you guys are doing uh, your conference, obviously mm -hmm. virtually. I wanted to see if you had anything you could share about that, what's going on, what the timing of that is, and how people can potentially be more involved with that leadership. Yeah. Um, so when we went virtual in March, uh, I decided that we would not do anything virtually that we wouldn't have done post-pandemic. Um, and so in 2019, we had 57 events around the world. Uh, in 2020 thus far, we've had 130, um, including a global virtual pride platform we created called Proudly Resilient. Uh, we had 41 events all across Pride Month, uh, and all of them benefited 21 intersectional and LGBT nonprofits, which I was very proud of. Um, our talent programs expanded this year as well. So our Out Next program, we just launched a global curriculum in March, I'm sorry, in uh, August. Uh, we had 2,500 young leaders from 110 countries, from 110 companies and 27 countries participate in that platform. Um, our European summit, uh, which was hosted by HSBC, uh, happened in September. Our Asia summit, which was also hosted by HSBC and um, EY and KPMG just completed in October. We're about halfway through our US summit and uh, kicked off our Australia summit last night. And the, I'd say the thematics are, are similar to what we're talking about today. Uh, you know, the idea that business is continuing to drive change, uh, that companies are driving change around the world, CEOs using their platform um, matter you know, significantly. We have our, our second CEO roundtable this afternoon. Uh, we had 17 CEOs and chairman on Monday and we have another 13 uh, this afternoon. Uh, and we convene those roundtables with the opportunity to share our data and research. So we published four pieces of research this year, including the first ever global ally research, which I can share with, with you guys to share. Uh, we had 5,000 leaders across 11 countries and we had 3,000 leaders in the United States. And then we went back out in the field post COVID to understand really what the difference was. Um, and then the idea of really making it actionable so that leaders need to actually come out as allies, we say, just like LGBTQ people have to come out, allies have to come out. Um, and the impact that that makes in companies and cultures now. So there's a lot of conversation around obviously working from home and what that impact creates. Um, how does that impact people's covering, right? Hiding an aspect of their identity in the workplace. Um, and ultimately what has been really kind of fun and we've had probably 40 different CEO sort of one-on-ones uh, that I've interviewed this year. The, the conversation around the, the, the Zoom boxes, everybody's equal. Mm -hmm. Right. You can't really talk over folks. Everybody, you know, it's not a, a board table where somebody's at the head, et cetera. You know, th there are some interesting positives uh, that, of course, go with the challenges of working from home. But, you know, from a cultural perspective, the ability to have more diversity be heard is something that a lot of companies have said is is a silver lining coming out of this. I like the Zoom as the great equalizer. Yeah, that's it fantastic. is. And and, you know, people can't always, you know, I got my, my orchid and that's that's nice. But you know, my dog could bark any moment and, you know, people, you know, people want to manage their, their profile and their, their look and feel as much as they can, but you can't, right? I mean, you, you got the CEO with the kid, like, you know, walking in behind him or, you know, the cat walking across you know, that humanizes people. And I think that makes people more authentic. And I think that's, that's not a bad thing. I think that's a good thing. Yeah. I mean, I'm coming to you from my living room. So obviously this is 
this is just my my stuff so sorry i couldn't clean up too much now <laughs> same 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 <laughs> exactly um just to 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 bookend this um wanted to see if you would share your best advice to people listening today who want to start or increase change at their firms maybe they're not part of out leadership maybe they don't have representation i you know i personally am lucky to have someone here who is is a, you know a mentor for me and and that they are you know out at the firm and we have very supportive leadership of uh, people bringing their genuine selves to work as as small a firm as skybridge is and salt is you know i was happy to find that so people who aren't as fortunate or in positions what what, what do you think they can do well let's say a couple things you know from a, a firm perspective would welcome and love more companies to be members of our leadership um, and I'm happy to talk about that anytime, anyplace, anywhere. Um, and we can send info, but info at outleadership is the easiest um, in terms of reaching out there. Um, you know, I would say companies have the opportunity and leaders have the opportunity to, to really look inward and figure out how they can leverage the platform that they have, right? So we have companies that are 250 people and we have companies that are 300,000 people. Um, and the size of the company really is irrespective of the leaders uh, that, that are leading the company. Um, I, I reflect on Noel Quinn, the global CEO of HSBC, uh, who's on our board, um, talked about his leadership style, which is, you know, he has roughly 300,000 people that work for him. And he looks at it as if he has five. And he, he literally says, how would I manage with just a team of five? That's how I manage with a global organization like HSBC. So being available where he can, being authentic, being transparent, all of those things really matter. Um, and I think, you know, from a diverse perspective and what these companies can do for their employees and in the communities that they're working in, I, I think that's, that's the approach. Um, and it really does just take visible leaders, um, allies and LGBT folks and people of color, all of the different groups uh, have an opportunity, I think, to lead. And it, it really does require corporate support. So I'm glad that, I'm glad to hear that, that you have that with Skybridge and Salt. I'm not surprised, but, but that's, that's really important. I think you can never underestimate the impact whether it was David Marshall Grant on me when I was 18 or any of the CEOs I've had the pleasure of working with over the years that you never know the impact that you're going to make. Um, and being open to creating that impact, I think is a, a huge gift that leaders can give to their employees, to their clients, and even to their families. Fantastic. Well, Todd, this has been, this has been awesome. Um, I'm glad that we're able to do this now on a yearly basis. Hopefully we'll make it more frequently. I'm, you know, looking forward to the partnership between salt and out, out leadership for, for the coming year, but I want to wish you guys the best for your conference going on. I can't imagine the, the lift of doing a fully virtual conference. I am not envious right now. <laughs> Luckily, I have a great team. They're the ones that do all the hard work. Um, but I will send you, you the link that you can share with folks if people, we have two public programs for each of the summits and very happy to have any of your constituents join uh, the US or Australia. Um, I would love and, that. Uh, yeah, it's exciting. Well, thanks for having me. It's nice to Nice to see you at least through the screen and um, and I'm excited to continue to have the conversation with you guys and with Salt going forward. Absolutely.